great already. Um, all right, well, thank you, Francine and for Laura for being here. Um, so this will be the, it's the closeout meeting for the 2020 grant and then the startup meeting for the 2021 grant. Um, so we are uh, basically for the 2020 grant, we just received your last invoice. Um, and I sent that down to the accounting department to process that. Um, and so you should receive that in the coming weeks, I imagine. But that'll be the last, uh, I think that that zeroes out the the uh, the balance on the 2020 grant. So that's great. Um, so we'll ha kind of have a clean slate moving into the into the next grant once that's up and running. Um, and I think you had submitted the quarterly reports all throughout for the 2020 grant. So we're up to date with those as well. <clears throat> um, and then let's see here. Yeah, so we'll have, um, yeah, so I think for the 2020, we'll consider this the final quarterly report. You know, we love, you know, cause I think it ended June 30th anyways, <clears throat> but we'd love to, um, you know, you can submit a quarterly report and then we'll consider it the final one. Um, and hopefully, you know, the payment will be processed by the end of the year as well. So that way it can just be all done on our end as well. Um, mm -hmm. and so just, you know, when I, I think you do, but when you write your quarterly reports, the beneficiaries is cumulative and then, you know, we'll just make sure everything matches. Um, you know, we put it in our grant system and, um, I think that's it. You know, usually we like, make sure, ask if you've met your beneficiaries or if you found any challenges with the program, it seems like you're doing it again and your the number of beneficiaries has grown or what you're proposing for next year. So I'm assuming you're meeting or you're seeing an increased need. Yes, definitely. There's not so many comments there. Um, and then we fund, block grant funds, you know, it's like, you know, the a caseworker, the supervisor, right? And then um, a lot of, you know, mostly programmatic. And it did your, is there a new caseworker or a different caseworker for the program? No. No. Uh -uh. And for 2021, it's I'm sorry. And for 2021, it'll be the same. So there's not a change in staff or anything. For not the yet. No. Nope. We did hire a caseworker, but that's for for our DCF contract. She's not um, oh, okay. doing the housing okay. program. Well, you know, she has a, I, I'm not obviously looking at the budget, but she does have some community cases. So I can't remember now if in the budget we allocated some of her time to that because she does some community cases. But so if you're seeing another caseworker, that's what that would be. For the 21, we have, um, looks like there's a family caseworker and then a program supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so I think that may be some of Janae's time and, and Francine. Right. And then did, um, I don't know, Ben, do you have anything else for the 2020? I feel like it's probably all set. Just about the, uh, you mentioned the um, <clears throat> the quarterly report. When, when are they, are you saying this meeting is acting as the quarterly report or they're supposed no, to No, no, they just have to submit report? one by you know July 10th, but we would consider it the last report for the 2020 grant year. Okay. So I'm I'm confused by that too. Yeah, me too. I, I submitted the fourth quarterly report to Ben. And that's so it would be a fifth quarterly report. That's what I'm confused about. That I thought too. our funding ended in April. Was it April right. and we just got the last invoice? Is that what it was, Ben? I think so, yeah. So yeah, it was April, April to April. Uh, well, April, so so the program ended in March by April. So even yeah, the yeah. The last yeah it was from January to March, and then the last quarterly report was due April 11th. Okay, so then we didn't get the final payment so far on our end. We'll just um, we'll submit a quarterly report and just say that it was an administrative closeout this quarter, so you don't have to submit anything. So it's not a programmatic piece. Okay. We, yeah. All right. Yeah, I think I think going forward, Francine, you're basically been doing intakes thinking it's the new grant the new so, right yeah. right right um, yeah. 
but the contracts for the new grant, we can jump, I guess we can jump to 2021. Yeah, so for 2020, we can say that that's done. Yeah, um, it was done as of April 1 or March 30th or whatever. And we'll do the closeout then on our end. Mm -hmm. um, and for 2021, I forget when the contract started, the date was it? It was back to June, 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 1st. June 1st. So essentially we had May, May, we have May intakes. Do you want us to, that we're think, we were thinking they'd be part of the new grant, but should we just not include them or should we include them in the June numbers? Um, well, so are you, they were, they were intake, intook, I don't know what the word is, but uh, taken in, in, in May, but then the, uh, are they receiving, you know, services and working with the caseworker in June? Some of them, yes. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, if they continue, I'd say you can have them as part of the, you know, the new 21. The new. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if it has an intake date of May something, it's okay to include them. With well, as long as they continued service, you know, if it was just like a, yeah. you know, it came once in May and they resolved an issue, then okay. they just That's were, okay. they're, at, they're, yeah, they're between our two grant years. Yeah, yeah, okay. And the income limits change. I think Ben is going to send an email out soon um, for that. Yeah, I was curious. I was just looking through um, your application, which I guess at this point was submitted almost a year ago, but just looking at some of your goals and objectives and um, program information. Are, are you still um, continuing kind of with the hybrid model with in-person and remote, or is it? No, it's now pretty much all in person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're back in person. I'm back in the office. But we still obviously have the capacity, so we're still yeah. getting clients who test, you know, test positive. So we can continue serving them even if they're, you know, if, if we can meet them with them. Yeah, yeah. And are you still going to housing court or is that, how does that work? Yeah, so it's still on Zoom, and um, basically, as clients, if they get a court date, then of course they notify us, and then they'll come into the office, and we'll Zoom together. Mm -hmm. But um, physically going in person isn't happening right now. Right. And then, did you did you have other town funds for um, or any other additional funds for this program? I mean, we did reduce the budget from the original request. We do not have town funds for this project, no. No. Um, uh, for this project, we have, uh, we make up the shortfall with um, fundraise dollars. Um, we have some money from a foundation and we have, you know, we do a fundraising appeal and a event, hence this event on, yep. yeah, so. Yeah, no, because at one point there has been discussion of, you know, using ARPA funds for, you know, something similar, but I don't know, you know, where that went. Um, uh, well, I do, we are, um, we are managing some emergency town funds. I'm not sure if that's ARPA money. We're, we're not getting, we're not getting money for our time. We're, we're just, we're just managing it as kind of, I sort of see it as an extension of this work, you know? Right. Because we're that's what we do. We're we're always looking for money for um, for our clients, you know, to keep them housed. And so, uh, so you know, when the when Sean approached us approached me about uh, managing this, you know, I said, well, we I don't need to take money from that for us. I'll just we'll just use you know, it'll just be another source for. The families we work with and um and of okay. course we'll include them anybody who we're all not already working with under for housing retention they will become housing retention clients yeah. so that i'm sure will raise that uh number because of that right no but yeah. Yeah. no that, yeah i think those are the funds yeah so that's interesting i don't realize since they're not paying for <clears throat> your personnel i think that's fine to include them as beneficiaries so the programs aren't mm -hmm. you know we're not it's double dipping necessarily exactly. right well that's what i was right no we're not we're not uh we're not uh getting paid twice we're just uh 
I didn't want, I, you know, it, it was more important to me to have a nice big amount of money for folks to access since this is what we do anyways, you know, we're always looking for money. So to be able to have control of a source of money is fabulous. Yeah. That's great. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and then for the 21, you know, we'll, you'll probably run it down, you know, to, to, into next year. So you run about a 12 month program. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. You had estimated about 300 um, beneficiaries. Do you still see that as the same number? I would say so, especially if Laura said, well, as you know, we're get, the notice goes out, I'm sure we're going to get more people coming in once they know they can come to us to access funds if they're in rental arrears. We're probably going to start seeing a lot more people that we haven't worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, yeah, so one thing I think, you know, I, Ben, we did a 12 month uh, contract term, right? E yes. Yeah, so I think you know, sometimes, I, you know, usually it doesn't happen, but sometimes services finish in like eight months spending the money, but we would still ask for a programmatic report for 12 months. So, you know, we're essentially saying this is a 12 month program and you can spend the CDBG dollars, you know, quicker, but then we would still want, you know, um, the quarterly report in beneficiary form mm -hmm. for 12 months. You know, um, there's some programs, right? They might not get as much block grant money and they, they spend it in six months and then they think they're done, but. Oh, you know, they were, we're trying to, you know, we have a 12 month window and that's really for the program. Um, so it's know. just, it's staying the same for us, basically. It'll yeah. be four yeah. quarterly reports, right. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting. Sometimes you're like, oh, well, I, you know, I spent my money down in, you know, six months. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's great. Money's been fungible. Like you, you know, the idea is to have a 12 month program um yeah i see what you're saying if you've spent it and then they don't have they're not serving people then they don't have a quarterly report to, to do right but yeah but yeah we will mm -hmm. do yeah we yeah. don't do that we're always this is ongoing mm -hmm. yeah and then, time, so nate so. the the first quarterly report that for 2021 would be july 10th yes that would right? be july yeah okay yeah yeah so the first right 21 report yeah so that would be from April, wait, yeah, April to June. Well, really, just July ten. Really, just June. Oh, that's okay. when the contract starts. So, like, whatever you know, like we said, whatever beneficiaries oh. that you you know carried into June. Okay. All right. So, so the, you can anticipate that the June report will probably be a little on the light side since it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's fine. I mean, for some, it might even be just like a paragraph and, you know, we had a startup meeting and they're, you know, you know, someone, if it, for instance, if it was a new program and they're just starting, I, you know, right. I wouldn't expect much. Yeah, actually, Francine, you, usually you, you don't see people for just a month, right? I mean, most of, most of the time you're, you're working with folks in one capacity or the other for multiple months, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. especially if it has to do with like housing authority that just isn't, you know, done in a month that yeah. that goes on mm -hmm. for several months. Right. So maybe maybe that maybe it won't be so light since uh, it'll be May and June, you yeah. know, it, with 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 the understanding that we're still working with them in June. Right. So. Right. And then do you, you mentioned the housing authority. Have you, how's your relationship with them? Do you see a lot of clients from the housing authority properties or? A lot. Yeah. That, that's been a really big increase with the housing authority. I think because they're going through their own staffing issues and they're falling behind and then it's falling on tenants. Like they're not recertifying people from, from like last year. And then they're going back and telling folks, now you owe us all this money from 2021 January 21 to now and so now I'm getting legal aid involved so I'm like well that's not their problem that that you guys were understaffed and you're falling behind why is it the tenants fault that now they owe you all this money so I have several cases right now that legal aid has been involved in because of that yeah and what is that for me one of the things that I find just staggering is that 
they start proceedings to take away people's section eights and they yeah. immediately go to you know hearings instead of like just trying to work out a you know a plan i mean it, it's it it's their inability to do what they are tasked to do and then they immediately take the stance that the tenant is at fault and it's 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 aggressive and it's it's not very collaborative and uh, we've never had a relationship with the Amherst Housing Authority like we do now uh, and it's really really too bad that's yeah. because yeah it's <sighs> that is too bad yeah I've heard, I've heard a little bit of that um, I yeah. don't know exactly why but does the town have any um, ability to to say hey this is not okay i mean do you um, i mean you know, if we you know after this meeting i could talk to my supervisors and just ask and see if there's anything i mean we also fund them through capital um we you know, block grant with capital projects um and so you know uh, i know they've had some staff turnover so you know i've you know you know i'm I want to make sure that they're meeting, you know, the capital project requirements for block grant. But typically, in terms of their operations, you know, they're they're independent from the town. I mean, they're quasi public, right? But not yeah. town government. So we could, you know, we could always have a meeting though. Just um, if we hear that, you know, their um, their tenants, you know, voucher holders or you know, tenants in their properties are having trouble. I mean, we used to get um, near the end when we were doing our emergency, you know, funds, we, I was surprised actually how many right tenants coming from housing authority properties had issues, whether they were behind in something and just, I, I was just, I just found it surprising as well. Um, but. Yeah. And I, I think that, uh, I think that there's just, a, a my understanding of the housing authority is it is to keep people housed. Uh, and I understand that there are rules and you need to do this and you need to do that. And you need to report if you have a increase in income or you need to report if there is a household change. But if a tenant does that and then the authority doesn't act on that in a reasonable amount of time and then that becomes a tenant's um, uh, the cause of a tenant being at risk of losing their subsidy or losing their housing in Amherst. Uh, because of the authority's actions, and then they're treated so badly. I just think there's a fundamental problem, you know? Yeah. yeah. And advocate, as, as advocates, we can do what we can do. You know, we can get uh, legal aid involved. I mean, thank goodness Francine is the expert in housing that she is, but I'm sorry, I'm, I would guess there are Amherst residents who, for whatever reason, don't contact us and and so it's just it's not a good situation i don't think yeah no thanks for letting us know yeah like i said we can talk to our supervisors and maybe have a meeting great good good yeah. good yeah and then um yeah i mean I, you know you've run the program um pretty well so this you know i i don't like to say we're complacent but it's nice to know that you understand the block grant rules and reporting and intake forms and so you know, when you do intake, you still verify income eligibility, right? And then there's a file you keep. Um, yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Yep, everybody, that, that's the first step is doing the housing intake and then having them sign that, um, the form with their income at the end. That's good, yeah, we have a new program uh, representative from DHCD. So, you know, in the last few years, our, our contact with the block grant program has changed as well. And so we'll be, we'll be, we have an interim one now and we'll be getting a new one. And they may ask more questions of us and we may then in turn ask, you know, from our, our activity. So, you know, Ben or I may be reaching out more in the next few months, you know, three, four, five, six months, if there's questions, just, you know, they may have some as well. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, you know, um, you know, just if they have, you know, clarifying questions or something. So. Sure. You know, and we have these meetings just to clarify that we consider our social services and other uh, activities subcontractors. You know that you're we we have a contract agreement. You're a grantee. We're not. Um, you know, you're not subrecipients, which would mean that you would then be subject to audit through the block grant. 
but because we set up the income guidelines and do a request for proposals, the way we select activities through procurement and then the way we kind of set up the parameters for a contract, then it's considered a you know contract agreement as opposed to a subrecipient agreement. So, you know, the our block grant program may ask to verify intake forms or income eligibility, you know, you know, they may ask that your beneficiary forms just be, you know, you could verify that information, but they wouldn't ever ask for your financial information or to do an audit. You know, they would just ask for things relative to programmatic um, review. Great. Good. Yeah. You know, we verify. So, you know, I think it's still Stephen who sends it in for family outreach, but you know, he does a good job. So for the, on the financial piece, you know, your invoices are fine. You know, all the Great. backups there. And then um, if we have questions, we email with, you know, with CHD. So um, that's been working out fine. Great. Good. So, yeah, Ben, do you have any questions with that? I mean, I feel like family outreach is good. Yeah. There's some other accountants at CHD for some other programs. Sometimes they, um, you know, it might take a little bit more back and forth to, to finalize an invoice, but. Yeah, no, no, comp no, no further questions the i find the invoices uh, the last one we got was really straightforward and easy to understand and find the make sure it all matched and everything so appreciate yes. that yes Stephen uh is very nitpicky yeah which, um can drive me crazy sometimes honestly but you yeah. know it's it also means really really clean information you know so right yeah, I mean, for instance, like, you know, the June 1st, the start of the month, maybe it's a different in your billing cycle, but, you know, we want to see expenses from June 1st on. But last year, some of the programs we started mid-April, just because that's the way it worked, but they would build back to the start of April. Oh, um, yeah. So that was an... it. And they're like, oh, we really? I'm like, well, we do, because that's when our contract start is. And then they would say, well, that's going to be really difficult. Like, I'm sorry, but that's, you know, <laughs> you could start yeah. May 1. You don't even have, you know, if it's going to be too difficult to split up a month, start May 1, but don't, right. you know, right. we can't really pay for something with a you know a stamp date of before the contract and so steven's good like that yeah oh no he gets it he definitely gets it um okay i'm not sure i have <laughs> and, and are you um uh, in is the the next year's application process are you when when are you do you know yet? I know you, there was some question about what was happening with grant cycles for this next for the next one. Yeah, I think DHD, you know, they put out a um, a draft document last week saying that they're going to combine the twenty two grant, which usually would have been this year, with the twenty three grant, and so they're kind of skipping a year. Oh. Um, so next, so you know, the twenty two and twenty three applications will be due March of twenty three. So we're going to start our process this fall. And then you know, have proposals due sometime later this year. And then DHC is hoping to get funding awards out um, July of 23. So, you know, there's not, there might be a little, there might be a gap in funding because, you know, we're in our 21 cycle, but we started it late. Got um, it. The only, the, you know, what's interesting is DHC is combining grant years. So, you know, Amherst is eligible basically to apply for 1.6 million you know, two week grant years, and they're asking for a 24 month implementation um, schedule. So it may be that for all activities, you know, we can still only fund five social services and we would just ask everyone to submit a 24 month budget. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is a little strange. Um, yeah. 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 So that's, that's what they're proposing right now. Um, some mm -hmm. communities are really pushing back. I'm, I'm, I'm a little, we haven't yet. I, I think DHCD is not going to change. They're just, you know, I think they're, I think they're um, with COVID money and then everything's, you know, delayed a little bit. I, I think that they are going to combine the 22 and 23 and have it be due next March. I think the things they might change would be, you know, because it's a two year cycle, could we have more flexibility in terms of number of social services or I don't know, you know, something, but I don't really think they're going to have a 22 round right now. I think yeah. they just wait. Um, well, that's so interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so these are going to say, like what happened last year, they were proposed the same thing. And then it was around now they had a lot of pushback and then they said, Oh, we'll do a quick round. We'll be due in September. And then, you know, we quickly put a process together, but I actually don't think they're going to do that this year. I think they're, they're just going to 
stick to the 22 and 23 being combined, but um, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we just, they just put out a, like, you, you can, if we can send you it, it's a public document, it's on their website. It's like a three page document kind of outlining this. And it's, I think it just came out last week. Um, so we haven't, we haven't let anyone know. I just, um, we're figuring out what to do as a town. And like I said, some other communities are really trying to see if there's a way to change it. But I think for DHD's purposes, you know, if the application is due in March, I think it works better because they also, you know, work with other funding programs and then it help, helps, you know, I think what they're hoping to do is then start contracts on July 1st to align with the fiscal, you know, the local fiscal year and state fiscal year. So it's just a better cycle for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's been kind of wonky. They, you know, for us and I, it sounds like for the town too, it's like you're crossing fiscal years, yeah. which is always weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to create a gap for us to, um, I mean, I feel like there's a three to six month gap in expenses for, you know, for either, you know, depending on how program, how fast programs spend money down, but there's going to be, you know, potential gap in block grant funding. So there won't be continuity, but then hopefully in the future after where there it would be. Okay. You but know, maybe we'll get back on the regular schedule. I mean, wasn't it always due in sort of mid-December, the proposal? Yeah, so I mean, it stinks it's on the holiday season. So, I th you know, Ben, we were just talking about it the other day, saying maybe we could try to, if we know that, and even this year, like, you know, they provided information now. We might try to have the our out outreach process a little sooner and try to have mm -hmm. proposals due a little sooner, just, you know, just so we're not scrambling around new years and yeah 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 that makes sense and yeah i mean i feel like my two years of experience it seems ambitious that if the applications are due in march that they would have contracts up and running by july 1st but that's what they're saying as of now but <laughs> yeah i mean they yeah sometimes what they do is they'll get us contracts in like late august or september and then they'll allow us to oh backdate it Backdate it, which is really strange because, you know, for instance, for like services, how do we, how do you know, start, how do we actually start <laughs> something and meet with you in September and say, oh, what you, what you have been doing since June, right? Yeah. Or that, or since July can count for this grant year, like if we haven't given you an intake form or if you're not doing that, it's just, so usually even in the past, they did that once or twice and I would just start it, you know, like September one or October one, because it was just easier than trying to go back, um, right. you know, our, our auditors have questioned how the state can do that. Right. You know, our, the towns, you know, we, you know, our, our third party auditors have, they don't really like that. <laughs> um, all righty, well, are there any more questions from either of you? Mm, not me. All right. Nope. Well, good luck with your uh, fundraising efforts. Scrambling, Thank you. Scrambling around town. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. This is actually a very nice break. I'm just sitting yeah. here. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. It's nice over Zoom, actually. I, you know, I, you know, you're close, but Zoom can be convenient. Very yeah. convenient. Yes. yes, very convenient. No driving time has to be yeah, exactly. scheduled in for meetings. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Although I have to say, I went, I met with uh, Sean and Leah uh, from the town fiscal around, you know, the, uh, the emergency fund money. And uh, we sat in a room together in a, that meeting room. I mean, the three of us actually met each other in person mm -hmm. and sat in the same room. It was, it was shocking, but quite nice. fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, actually, I had an in-person meeting for a pre-construction meeting and there was probably dozen or 15 people in the meeting room it was the biggest in-person meeting I've been in for you know two years yeah you know we also try to sit spread out uh -huh. <laughs> in the big town room but it was kind of funny to have um you know I guess for the contractors it's easier just to and everyone just to be there but um you know sometimes zoom is nice for those meetings I've also had them over zoom and it's like you can show the plans on the screen and it's like everyone can see it clearly and then you can you know walk yeah. through it pretty easily but very true. Very true. Well, I love the fact that the hearings are all um, on Zoom because I live an hour away and it's in the evening. So 
being able to still make dinner and then run upstairs and do the Zoom is really, it's really fabulous, really fabulous. Uh, I agree where it may change in July. The provisions <laughs> for remote meetings is set to expire a month from now. And oh. unless there's some change at the state level, we'll have to go back to being in person. So we're, we're waiting to see what happens. That'd be sad. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I just found there's a bill they attached onto the budget um, that the Senate passed, I guess. There's a House passed of one budget, and then the Senate tacked on this bill allowing remote meetings. And, you know, they throw things on the. On the oh, desk. yeah. But so now they have to go back, and, you know, there's probably a number of different things on it. I think there's some housing ones as well. And so now it has to go back through and be approved by both again. And so um if they pass that then one if, depending on what they accept one of the provisions is for remote meetings to continue through december of 23 2023 awesome yeah. awesome yeah cool i like them too to be honest it's like work-life balance <laughs> yes. yeah i know and for like other meetings i've been like i'm on a board coastal board and the attendance has increased like for our monthly membership meetings because of their on zoom so yeah I agree. That's, not, yeah. That's not necessarily a good thing at the hearings, though. It just means that they, I mean, I can't imagine the employees, you guys, who, you know, you've already worked, I would, I'm assuming you basically worked that day. And then the, those meetings are interminable. I mean, they're, they're really, I, I, I feel for you guys. <laughs> sure, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, the oh, poor council, every council meeting now is like five hours. <laughs> oh, Jeez, nuts. That is nuts. It is. Well, thanks again. Yeah, so I'm glad you're st we're starting up and we'll we'll let everyone know about the next grant cycle. Ben, I think, so just send an email, but once yeah. it's confirmed, we'll let everyone know and we'll, you know, I, I think we're trying to start something in August for, you know, a public process, so. Okay, that right. sounds good. You know, well, let me just suggest, I mean, the one thing about doing something in August is so many people are away. I know. But we I mean, just, that's it. yeah, I agree. It's just we'd like to, I mean, Ben, what we were saying yesterday, it would be great if proposals could be due in like November and then right. as opposed to like December 17th or something. So if they're due at some point in November, it just gives everyone a little bit more time. Um, and the state's now asking us to, to essentially have activities somewhat determined in December, you in know, December, December yeah. even though it's the application's not due until March. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, a, that would be, that's my only thing about August is so often I'm trying to juggle, you know, the meeting, but you know, I mean, Francine always could attend to it. If I'm, I'm, I'm gone too in August. Yeah. Well. I was about to say, I'm yeah. taking some time. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> might, might I suggest September? <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, thank you All guys. Right. All right, Thank thanks. you both very much. Yeah. All righty. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Bye. Have a good Bye. rest of the day. Thank you.